seated. Problems that we don't normally have, where the disc was stuck. I had to turn the machine off twice and finally put a new disc in. Praise the Lord. It's running now. Luke 24, verses 1 through 12, is the text that the Lord has laid on my heart today to share with you. That's the text in which we find the angels appearing. And we find two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake with you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us to remember his words. Our Lord Jesus Christ expounded the scriptures. He showed all the things in the scriptures that pointed to him. He told the disciples the scriptures. They had to be reminded, but then they remembered that he had said these things unto them. The reason they didn't believe is because they didn't know the scriptures. Father, make us people who believe the word of God, who are diligent about studying it, memorizing it, meditating upon it, and then sharing it with others. We pray, Father, for your word that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. In Jesus' name, amen. On this bright and early morning, we remember and celebrate the most joyful sunrise since the creation of the world. On the first day of creation, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the night from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. On the first day of the week, light came into the world. On the first day of the week, Christ, the light of the world, rose from the dead. On the first day of the week, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to fulfill the day of Pentecost. On the first day of the week, every week, the church has, since her birth, celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our celebration today was first announced by angels, heard by women, spread by apostles, and was seen by over 500 Christians at once. Our celebration today struck screeching terror into the hearts of hardened soldiers, produced chaos and confusion among hypocritical religious leaders, resulted in the payment of huge bribes to spread lies, and ended in the political manipulation of the ruling governor. But all of the political, legal, and mafia-like religious machines of the ancient world, down to the present day, could not crush the Rose of Sharon, could not trample the Lily of the Valley, could not extinguish the blinding light of salvation, could not deny by death the overwhelming life, could not stop the mouths of witnesses who knew that what they had seen was true. The resurrection of Christ was no small event. It started with an explosion of the supernatural, rattled the foundations of apathetic religion, turned an empire upside down, hypercharged lackadaisical sluggard disciples, replaced frantic fear with ferocious faith, passed from hand to hand with intense speed, passing from the lips to the hearts with regenerating power, and reached from the highest rulers and the most august supreme courts to the depths of the lowest stinking prisons. Christ is risen. The victory is won. There is no fear of death. We are free. We rejoiced last year that this celebration is a relay race with a baton handed from each faithful Christian to others, from each faithful father to his faithful sons, from each faithful mother to her faithful daughters, from each faithful man to other faithful men, from each faithful generation to the next faithful generation, from each faithful nation to other faithful nations. For the past 2,000 years, some have dropped the baton, but other faithful men have picked it up and carried it high so that others might hear and see. And it started with angels. Angels cleared the track. 
Angels announced the race. It was an angel that fired the starting gun. It was angels that watched the runners get off their marks. It is angels who continue to watch with excitement and with the greatest interest as the runners plunge with determination through their grueling course, overcoming obstacles, fighting battles along the way, facing sword and spear, lion and bear, fire and drowning, hatred and persecution, nakedness, peril, heat, cold, rejection by family and friends, mocking by reprobates, imprisonment and death by governments, and the most intense savage revenge by supernatural demonic forces. But still, they race on with bleeding feet, with wounded bodies, with gasping breath, with breaking bones, wrenching muscle spasms, through the blinding rain and dark, with evil beasts of hell racing behind, clawing at their backs and legs as they run, dodge, climb the cliffs, while vicious birds of prey attack their blood-drenched heads. Friends, were in that race. Last year, we looked at the resurrection news like a marathon relay. It's a relay that has been run through the early morning dew, through the heat of the noonday sun, into the fog and shrouded twilight, and the baton has become a torch that is carried into the black darkness of midnight through the long and lonely night, eagerly awaiting the dawning sun. There have been dangers, an ambush, and wild beasts. All along the way, there have been deceptions and treachery and suffering and cruel tortures and death. There have been apostates and heretics who have turned aside to the torch into false doctrine. There have been slothful, careless, worldly messengers who have brought shame to Jesus, who put the baton in the hands of those first runners. But there have been others who with determined stride and solid grip, set jaw and eagle eye have pierced through the darkness, carrying the flaming baton through the night and toward the break of day. Are you one of them? Or do you hesitate? Turn back. Drop the baton. Slip anonymously into the crowd. Make a feeble excuse that you don't feel well. Shrink fearfully at the challenge and ultimately disobey your Lord who thrust you into the race. But today we want to consider the angels at the tomb and after the resurrection. Remember, the angels minister to you just as they did to those who first came to the tomb on that resurrection morning. But today their ministry is often completely unknown to the faithful servants who are struggling on through life. Do you know that angels follow us, give us succor and help? That the angels minister to those who are God's elect? The ones intent upon the race assigned to them as they plunge through that storm and black darkness while thunderbolts from hell give light to their pursuers. The angels minister without thanks. They do it without pay. They do it without recognition. They do it with interest and expectation as they watch God's plan unfold. They do it without seeking promotion. They do it without resentment or complaining. They do it day and night, every day, 24 hours per day, every day of the year, through our entire lives. They're there when we're born. They're there when we die and they carry us to our new home. They do it for very unimportant people and for little children. Not just for the great and mighty and important rich adults. Do you not know that you are the subject of angelic ministrations? Not merely the visitors at the tomb. Oh yes, they had a, a visitation of angels that they saw, but you are the subject of angelic ministrations. The angels are the servants of God the Son. The angels do his bidding. He is greater than the angels. He gives the angels their commissions, their commands, and their com commitment and their concern. And because Jesus cares for us and he therefore sends his servants to help us even when we don't know that they're there. Christ is the commander. He is superior to the angels, not one of them. The angels are his servants. And now that we are his children and we are a part of his bride, he has commissioned them to take care of us as he prepares a place for us at his side. Paul tells us so in Hebrews chapter 1. God 
who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now listen, he's going to start describing angels here. He's going to tell you the difference between the angels and Jesus. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the firstborn begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. And to the angels he saith, who make his, his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old, as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels, said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Now listen, here's verse 14. I just said a moment ago that there are angels ministering to you. You've never seen them. You've never met them, but there are angels ministering to you. Listen to verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? They not only minister to those that are saved. Did you hear what verse 14 said? They minister to those that shall be heirs of salvation. I read an incredible article about a World War II bomber flying a mission against the Nazis that makes me wonder if among them there were some heirs of salvation on board or that from those who were on board there would be descendants who were heirs of salvation. I'm just going to read you a little bit of this article. It's an incredible story. In 1943, a mid-air collision on February 1st, 1943, between a B-17 and a German fighter over Tunis dock area became the subject of one of the most famous photographs of World War II. An enemy fighter attacking the 97th bomb group formation went out of control, probably with a wounded pilot, then continued its crashing descent into the rear of the fuselage of a fortress named All American, pilot piloted by Lieutenant Kendrick R. Bragg of the 414th Bomb Squadron. When it struck, the fighter broke apart, but left some pieces in the B-17. The left horizontal stabilizer of the fortress, left elevator, were completely torn away. The two right engines were out, and one on the left had serious pump leak. The vertical fin and the rudder had been damaged. The fuselage had been cut almost completely through, connected only at two small parts of the frame. And the radios, electrical, and oxygen systems were damaged. There was also a hole in the top that was over 16 feet long and 4 feet wide at its widest. The split in the fuselage went all the way to the top gunner's turret. Although the tail actually bounced and swayed in the wind and twisted when the plane turned and all the control cables were severed except one single elevator cable still worked, the aircraft miraculously still flew. The tail gunner was trapped because there was no floor connecting the tail to the rest of the plane. The waist and tail gunners used part of the German fighter and their own parachute harness in an attempt to keep the tail from ripping off and the two sides of the fuselage from splitting apart. While the crew was trying to keep the bomber from coming apart, the pilot continued on his bomb run, released his bombs over the target. When the bomb bay doors were opened, the wind turbulence was so great that it blew one of the waste gunners into the broken tail section. It took several minutes for four crew members to pass him ropes from parachutes and haul him back into the forward part of the plane. When they tried to do the same for the tail gunner, when they tried to do this for the tail gunner, the tail began flapping so hard that it began to break off. The weight of the gunner was adding some stability to the tail section, so he went back to his position. The turn back toward England had to be very slow to keep the tail from twisting off. They actually covered about almost 70 miles to make the turn home. If you want to see this afterwards, one picture was taken by some RAF pilots as they went out to meet the bomber as it was returning home. 
There is one picture in the air, and there are other pictures on the ground. He, they turned back toward England. The bomber was so badly damaged that it was losing altitude, and speed was, all, and so it was soon alone in the sky. For a brief time, two more Messerschmitt 109 German fighters attacked the old American. Despite the extensive damage, all the machine gunners were able to respond to these attacks and soon drove off the fighters. The two waste gunners stood with their heads sticking up through the hole in the top of the fuselage to aim and fire the machine guns. The tail gunner had to shoot in short bursts because the recoil was actually causing the plane to turn. Allied P-51 fighters intercepting the All-American as it crossed over the channel and took one of the pictures shown. They also radioed to the base, describing that the appendage was waving like a fishtail and the plane would not make it, to send out boats to rescue the crew when they bailed out. The fighters stayed with the fortress, taking hand signals from Lieutenant Bragg and relaying them to the base. Lieutenant Bragg signaled that five parachutes and the spare had been used, so five of the crew could not bail out. He made the decision that if they could not bail out safety, then he would stay with the plane and land it. Two and a half hours after being hit, the aircraft made its final turn to line up with the runway, while it was still over 40 miles away. It descended into an emergency landing and a normal roll-off on its landing gear. When the ambulance pulled alongside, it was waved off because not a single member of the crew had been injured. No one could believe that the aircraft could still fly in such a condition. The fortress sat placidly until the crew all exited through the door of the fuselage and the tail gunner had climbed down the ladder, at which time the entire rear section of the aircraft collapsed. The old bird had done its job and brought the whole, whole crew home uninjured. If you want to see some pictures of the men standing around that piece of wreckage in World War II, you can come and look at them afterwards. Not only do angels minister to believers, the angels are the instruments that God uses in advance of that point in time when the unbelieving, unregenerate soul receives the light of the gospel and then is irresistibly transformed by the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit to bring life and salvation and repentance and regeneration, the indwelling of the Spirit, the seeding of the Spirit, eternal security, the first buds of life's transformation and growth, and all of the 34 things that the Holy Spirit does at the moment of salvation. The angels are God's invisible shepherds to whom he has entrusted the keeping of his elect so that we will not die or be killed by enemy forces before God's precise moment of drawing us to himself. Angels will be there when our spiritual warfare, our days in the battle, and our time of suffering comes to an end. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And see if Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And the angels are the ones that God sent to the tomb on that first resurrection morn. That's why we must not fear for the race to go on. We have the truth. Christ is risen. The victory is won. There is no fear of death. We are free. All the suffering is but a light affliction. It is but for a moment. All that the enemy of our souls can do is but his last feeble hurrah, for the head of the serpent has been crushed. The angry flailing is but proof that he has heard his own death knell. And someday there will be a final angelic military mopping up operation where the fiends of Lucifer will be driven from heaven. Their putrid, twisted, reprobate commander slammed, cursing and screaming into unbreakable chains and cast into the bottomless pit. Yes, the angels will be there for that as well. But God has also sent the angels to be there for us now. While the warfare is still at its fiercest, he uses them as his messengers, his supply line, his ministering balm in the heat of battle. Satan knows who we are. He has his network of spies, his informants, his knowing ones who report on us to his chain of command. But we are also surrounded by God's powerful, mighty, and flaming angels of fire. We have nothing to fear. Do you remember the incredible narrative of Elisha and the protection that God provided? Second Kings chapter 6 records it for us. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, 
None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore said he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. There is coming a day when all the saved of earth from all of history will gather to celebrate the chorus of this greatest of all celebrations, given to them by the risen Lamb of God, who is the eternal victor. As one body will gather at his feet to sing his praises with the noble line of apostolic martyrs, the great heroes of the Reformation, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Huss, John Knox and others, the multitudes of great evangelists, theologians and preachers who have thundered God's truth through the centuries and perhaps most important of all, for this is where we fit in, with the humble men and women and boys and girls who are just as precious in his sight as all of the mighty. Think of it. Angels were at the first resurrection morning to minister to those first visitors at the tomb, and they continue to minister to those who come by faith to the cross and the empty grave. Angels have watched over all of those great men and women of faith from that morning through the early church, through the Reformation, through the days of the Puritans and pilgrims, through the Christian men and women who founded our country through the war for independence, through the pioneers who bravely struggled west, through the civil war, through both world wars in Korea and Vietnam and all the recent wars in the Middle East. It's been angels who have watched over faithful missionaries struggling to bring the good news of the resurrection to those who have never heard. It has been angels who have watched over persecuted believers in communist countries, pagan countries, totalitarian regimes, fascist dictatorships, Hindu persecutions, and Muslim murders. It has been angels who've watched over God's elect from that first resurrection morning, generation after generation, doing the bidding of their master as they minister to those who shall be the heirs of salvation. It has been angels who have watched in awe at what God is doing as he irresistibly draws the elect to himself. Angels who view with intense interest the infinitely marvelous redemptive plan of God unfolding. The Bible says so. Listen to how Peter describes it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, now listen, and the glory that should follow. That's the resurrection. So that's our context here. That's our context. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied the death of Christ. They prophesied his burial. They prophesied his resurrection. The prophets didn't understand it. They were eager to find out about it. But listen to verse 12. Unto whom, that is, unto the prophets, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Last phrase of the verse. Listen carefully which things the angels desire to look into. They are so excited to see the, the redemptive plan that God is unfolding through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son, His reaching out to those who are elect. Old Testament prophets didn't know it yet. Old Testament prophets didn't see it yet. They began to understand that they were not prophesying it for themselves. They were prophesying it for you, which things the angels desire to look into. And finally, someday when we stand in glory, the angels will be there too. The Apostle John sees us in the midst of a multitude of angels and living creatures and all the redeemed out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation in Revelation chapter 5, verses 114, where, we ca where together we cast our crowns of victory at the feet of the one who loved us and redeemed us 
by his blood. Verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof, and nobody's found that can do it. And we get down finally, after the Lamb has been found and who opens the book, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us our, unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth forever. Verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are therein heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Do you understand that without the resurrection none of that will happen? Without the resurrection, there will be no glorious finale. Without the resurrection, there will be no angelic chorus joined by every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the scene. Without the resurrection, there will be no paean of praise from those who have been redeemed by God, by the uh, redeemed to God by the blood of the Lamb. Without the resurrection, we will never experience being made unto our God kings and priests. Without the resurrection, we shall never reign on the earth with Christ. The resurrection is not only the truth of the past and the hope of the present. It is the guarantee of the glories of the future. Without the resurrection of Christ, we are, as Paul so well puts it, of all men most miserable. There is no better way to express your thanksgiving and longing for that future day of glory than to mirror what all the redeemed will do in heaven, what all the angels will do in heaven, because this is, in fact, how we will express our joy in eternity with those myriads of angels and the redeemed of all the ages. I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. Every creature in heaven and earth saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for our resurrected Savior, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who took our place on Calvary's cross, who bore our sins, who suffered the infinite wrath of you as the Holy Almighty God the Father, who paid the penalty for sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But there could be no eternal life if Christ were not risen from the dead. That is the proof that his sacrifice for our sins is true. Help us never to forget the centrality of the resurrection. Oh, Father, we read so many tracts that talk about the death of Christ, but they totally leave out the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. We are of all men most miserable. Father, help us to remember that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We rejoice this morning, Father, because we serve Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is on the back of your bulletins today. Uh, if you will take your...